All right, if you have a Bible this morning, let's turn to Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 3, 13 is one passage. Acts chapter 3, 13. The other one is Acts chapter 4, verse 27. Acts chapter 3, 13. Acts 4, 27. In this passage here, in these two passages here, we have a kind of a a brief glimpse of uh, one man in history, a very famous man, and a man well known to history now because of his connection with Jesus Christ. And yet, if it hadn't been for his connection with Jesus Christ, nobody probably had ever known about him much one way or another. And the Holy Spirit just gives a, a few little, just a couple of brief things about this man, these pastors. In Acts chapter 3.13, and that would be Simon Peter preaching there at Pentecost. In Acts chapter 3.13, he's talking about Pontius Pilate. As it is about Pontius Pilate, that uh, Pontius Pilate was determined to let Christ go, determined to let him go, which is a very peculiar thing in view of the fact that he didn't ever let him go. He was determined to let him go, and yet he had him crucified. Pontius Pilate uh, prostituted his official trust as a public official and had a man crucified that he had declared to be innocent three times. Three times he said, I find no fault in him. I find no fault in him, I find no fault in him, then had him crucified, which is not much for a judge, you're in public office. And the passage says he was determined to let him go. All right, now you come over to Acts chapter 4, verse 27, look at that. In Acts chapter 4, 27, you see something else. In Acts 4, 27, you'll find that he must not have been uh, too determined. Because in Acts chapter 4, verse 27, it talks about the people gathered together against Christ. And it says, among those who were gathered together against him with the Gentiles was Pontius Pilate, see it, and Herod. So you have two conflicting accounts. Folks that like to talk about uh, the old contradictions in the Bible, they could sure get them a case there. I mean, one case there says that Pontius Pilate was determined to let him go, and the other case says he was gathered together against him. Now, the truth of the matter is, Pontius Pilate was in both cases. Pontius Pilate was determined to let Christ go, and he was against him. He said, well, how could he be both those things at the same time? Well, the Bible says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let not that man think he receive anything of the Lord. There's such a thing as being of a double mind on the thing. There's such a thing as knowing it's wrong and going ahead and doing it. Or knowing it's right and then not doing it. There's such a thing as being convinced that a certain uh, course of action would be a suicide, and then you take it. There's such a thing as being convinced a certain course of action is the right thing to do, and then not doing it. It's a very common thing with people. You take uh, Carl Menninger, he wrote a book one time called <coughs> Man Against Himself. Carl Menninger is the dean of American psychiatrists, the dean of American shrinks, and he wrote a number of books. So uh, One of them is Love or Die, and one of them is Whatever Became of Sin. Carl Menninger was the chief shrink at Topeka, Kansas. I don't know why Topeka, Kansas has so many strange things come out of it. That's where the Civil Rights Movement began in 1964, uh, Brown versus Topeka. That's where the Charismatic Movement came from, Bethel Bible College, Topeka, Kansas. That's where John Brown came from before he went to Harper's Ferry. That's where Peter Ruckman came from. It's a strange place. <laughs> Topeka, Kansas, a place out in the plains, and Kansas, a Republican, the most Republican conservative place in the United States. It must be a reaction or something against the place. I don't know what it is. Peculiar man. Anyway, you take old Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate in that book, as far as you know, that fellow, a, he's a good man, as far as you can tell. But he was against himself. Carl Menninger, the shrink, says the trouble is, party gets determined to take one action, party gets determined to take another action, and uh, after a while you get a conflict there that the ego can't uh, satisfy, and so the ego gets rid of one of the partners in the transaction. <laughs> that is, the fellow kills himself. That's what happens when the fellow gets divided against himself. And tradition tells us that Pontius Pilate went up to the Black Sea and was put at a little lonely outpost there, Roman outpost, because of the trouble he caused in Judea, and committed suicide. I don't know that so, that tradition. And when it comes to tradition, you can take tradition with a ton of bicarbonate of soda. But he's the kind of fellow who would do it. 
But he's the kind of fellow who didn't have the courage of his convictions. And you take old Pontius Pilate, he's a tragic case when you consider it. You think about uh, losing your soul just because you don't have any guts. That's a terrible thing. Book of Revelation says the fearful and unbelieving. Classifies the fearful with unsaved people, whoremongers, adulterers, liars. One of the great tragedies about uh, human nature being what it is, is the fact that good men that live moral upright lives go to hell and spend eternity with pimps and prostitutes and hustlers and junkies and kidnappers and murderers and swindlers and, and embezzlers. That's Pontius Pilate. Uh, the tragedy about Pontius Pilate, as far as you know, he was a good man. You don't read anything in the Bible bad about Pontius Pilate. As far as the biblical record is concerned, he never killed anybody. As far as the biblical record is concerned, he was a better man than David. He never did commit adultery, as far as the Bible record is concerned. You know, when a fellow like Judas Iscariot goes to hell, it's not too big a surprise. He was a devil to start with. When a man like Ahab loses his soul over, you know, over a piece of land, you're not surprised. With a wife like Jezebel, you couldn't expect much more. And you take a, when a fellow like, uh, old fellow like, uh, Herod loses his soul over a dancing girl, you're not surprised. I mean, a man with a father like, uh, Herod the Great who killed all the babies in Bethlehem under two years old, you wouldn't expect much from a man like that. Well, a man like Pontius Pilate, who as far as you can tell from the biblical record, was a good man. When a fellow like that goes to hell, it's a tragedy. But he went. And Pontius Pilate had a problem. And the problem he had was this. The problem was he had Christ on his hands and couldn't get rid of him. And Jesus Christ, the hardest person you ever tried to get rid of in all your life. You talk about a bad penny coming back. The Lord Jesus Christ is by far the hardest person you ever had to give the brush off to in your life. Pontius Pilate had Christ in his hands and he wanted to get rid of him and wanted to get him off his hands and he never made it. He never made it. Eventually he had to turn him over and have him executed, but the Bible says he was determined to let him go. Now I tried a number of ways to get rid of him and I'm going to talk about those ways here this morning. First of all, he tried this. He tried carelessness. That's the first thing a fellow always tries. When we begin to stand and sing, Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thy bid me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. The first reaction is carelessness. What's that? Oh, well, be over here in a while. Talk to a man about his soul. Well, I don't exactly accept Christ. I don't exactly reject him. Well, you know, I got my religion. You got yours. I was raised an older boy, and I'm going to born Catholic. I'm die Catholic. Give him the brush off. They give Christ the brush off. Carelessness, just dump him. You'll have a hard time dumping Jesus Christ. You won't have a trouble dumping me. You try to dump him, you got a job in your hands, boy. You got a job in your hands. But he tried it. He tried carelessness. I've seen men do that. I've heard men say, well, uh, I talked to a fellow one time about the Lord, and he said, well, I'm not ready to get saved. I said, then you reject Christ? Oh, no, 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 I don't reject him. I said, well, then will you accept him today as your Savior? Well, well, no, I don't exactly accept him. And I said, if you don't accept him, you reject him. He said, well, no, I don't exactly accept him, and I don't exactly reject him. No, no, not just talk to a man that's trying to make you think he's a good fella when he's a bad fella. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a hypocritical. That's, that's kind of like uh, making you think, well, if I, if I really could live a good life, I'd do it. No, the thing is, you accept him or you don't. It's like a marriage proposal. Uh, honey, will you marry me? Well, I do think you're the sweetest boy in all this world. Good, let's get married. Well, I don't want to hurt your feelings. Don't, let's get married. <laughs> when I just think the world of you, good, let's get hitched. When I don't misunderstand what I'm going to say, well, what is it, yes or no? <laughs> well, understand, I don't exactly accept you, and I don't exactly reject you. <laughs> well, you turn him down like a bedspread. That's the truth of the matter. I proposed a girl, and come back down in the mouth about it, and the fellow says, well, don't be so down in the mouth, man. All she said was no. He said, no, she said rats. <laughs> Guy asked a girl one time, said, will you marry me? She said, no. He said, is there anybody else? And she said, man, there's got to be. <laughs> <laughs> you accept him or you don't accept him. That's all there is to it. You don't have to fool around with the thing. The fellow says to his girlfriend, please tell me those Three little words that'll make me dance on air. And she says, go hang yourself. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know what men try to do? They try to brush off Christ. 
that crowd's out there in the yellow, what do we do with him? And they're yelling, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate's saying, why would evil have he done? And they cried in the louder, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate says to the Jews, he said, you take him. See, you take him. You judge him. You take care of him. And they, you know what they say? They say, we can't judge him. By our law, he ought to die. And we're a captive nation with an army of occupation. And it's unlawful for us to put a man to death. So what happens? He got him back in his hands again. You try to give Jesus Christ the brush off, it won't work. But he tried something else, and I've seen men try this. He tried cowardice. Give the responsibility to somebody else. He told about these things, and he, and he says to the Jews, he said, uh, what jurisdiction is he from? Then he says, from Herod's jurisdiction. That's up in Galilee. And Pilate said, good, I'll dump him off on Herod. And Herod was in town at the same time keeping the feast of Passover. So you know what old Pontius Pilate does? He sends him up to Herod. Got rid of him. Passed the buck. Dump it off on somebody else. And Jesus Christ came up before Herod and got up there, and Herod said, where are you from? And no answer. Are you John the Baptist risen from the dead? And no answer. Do a miracle? No answer. Are you the Son of God? No answer. There's one man Jesus Christ doesn't take ever time to fool with, never takes time to fool with, and that's a dishonest skeptic. You take these college-educated people, they say, well, where is Christ? Where is God? Let's see it. If I don't see it, I don't believe it. If you're God, show me something. I got news to you. The Lord isn't interested in showing you anything. You're nothing but just a perfect, you're a cipher with a rim knocked off, but I don't care whether you get it or whether you don't. You take old Herod, he had John the Baptist in prison and heard him gladly and observed many things because he saw he was a just man. And then one night at a dance, he sold his head out for a dancing girl and the Lord checked him off, never fooled him again. He's standing there saying, tell me this, tell me that. Sorry, you're too late. Oh, Herod had sinned away the day of grace, his conscience was seared and defiled, and the Lord wasn't going to fool him anymore, and the Lord never did fool him anymore. And Herod couldn't do nothing with him, so he arrayed him in purple robes and gorgeous array, and mocked him and made fun of him, and you know what he did with him? You know what he did with him? He sent him right back to old Pontius Pilate, and Pilate had him on his hands again. You talk about a man with nervous tension. That fellow's out there in that crowd saying, kill him, kill him, kill him, why would evil have he done? Kill him, kill him. His wife comes in and says, have nothing to do with this just man. I've suffered many of these things today in a dream because of him. That crowd yelling, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Pilots in the sweat. I've seen men do that. I've seen men play the coward. I've seen them play the coward. I've seen them sweat bloody murder. You know, some fellows, some fellows in this world have tremendous uh, physical courage. When it comes to spiritual courage, courage they haven't got the strength of a brownie or a Girl Scout. Some of you guys came to a knife fight or a knuckle fight, a brass knuckle fight, or go on to service, you put on a pretty good show. If you had to stand up here and tell people you love Jesus Christ, you'd faint. You haven't got any spiritual guts. I know men in this country that have great physical courage. When it comes to physical courage, they're like a roaring lion. If they had to stand up there in the street corner of their hometown and preach and pass out a track, they need smelling salts. No moral courage, boy. That's the trouble this fellow had here. He was a moral coward. I've seen him like that. I'll never forget one time I had a meeting up in Batesburg, South Carolina, and a Marine sergeant got saved there. He was a recruiting sergeant. And that fellow had a left chest that looked like an Army and Navy store. He had everything there but the Congressional Medal. He might have had that in his pocket. That old boy came down there. He was about six feet three. Had hash marks all over him and decorations all over him. Went back to the uh, prayer room and came back saved and came in there literally mopping the sweat off his brow. And I came up alongside and said to Tim, and I said, what took you so long, Sergeant? He said, what do you mean? I said, you're about 30, 35 years old, aren't you? He said, I'm 31. I said, where are you raised? He said, Carolina. I said, what took you so long? Anybody raised in Carolina has heard the gospel all their life, man. You can't come up in North South Carolina out here in the gospel at least 50 times a year. And I said, what took you so long? He said, I was scared. I said, scared? You scared? Tap in the left chest, you know, three spearhead invasion, you know, two purple hearts, silver star, have the whole works up there. I said, you scared? He said, preacher, he said, I've taken five machine gun nests single-handed. 
And he said, taking a machine gun nest single-handed is just like taking a glass of water. But he said, going down that aisle with all those women and children watching you, <laughs> he was shaken. The guy was shaken. You know what the thing was? He was afraid, playing the coward. I've seen him back out. Lack of, lack of moral courage. I remember years ago when I first began to preach, nobody much would have me in. I'm probably much rougher than I am now. I've, I've mellowed considerably through the years. When I first began to preach, nobody had me in, man. I preached on the street. And the first couple of churches had about 35 in them and 100 in them. And finally had a tent meeting down near Andalusia, Alabama. Had a big meeting. About four, 500 people showed up. And then I noticed the old Pharisees and scribes began to come around. And I wondered where they'd been all my life. And around they showed and they said, where do you go to school? I said, Bob Jones University. They said, well, you know, why don't you get your Ph.D. from Louisville? And I said, well, I listen to the old man up there. I've learned a lot from him. I learned more from him in the last couple of years than I have, 27 years anyplace else. I'm going back up and listen some more. And one of those fellows said to me, he said, well, you know, he doesn't stand in too good with us Southern Baptists. I said, why not? And they said, well, they said, he doesn't support everything we support. And I said, well, I've learned more fair than I have 27 years anyplace else. I'm going back and listen some more. One of those old association missionaries said, well, that isn't the real reason, reason we don't like him. I said, why don't you like him? He said, it's just jealousy. And told me the truth. But you see, he put the hook out first, see if I'd take the hook. And then when he found out the hook bent, then he let me off the hook and said, it was just jealousy. And the pastor of that church, he was really impressed at that meeting. He had a lot of additions, a lot of people saved, 40, 50 people saved, and had about 100 additions. And he decided maybe there might be something to it up there. He'd uh, been uh, a year at Louisville, then quit. And so he said, uh, I think I might go up there and come to school up there myself. I said, good, come ahead. So time went on. I went back to school. And a strange thing happened one day. I was out in my trailer, in the trailer court. I live in a plywood trailer, 40 feet long, hormonized, 25-pound block with a thing, you know, no bathroom, community bathroom. I was 28 years old, had a college education, and no hot running water, and stuffing blankets in the window to keep the cold out, and eating rice six times a week. And I was out there in the front yard of that little old trailer, that whole front yard of the trailer wasn't as big as this platform here. And I think I was out there on my bare feet. I usually am. I don't wear shoes unless I just have to. I think shoes are the devil. Always have thought that. Always will think that. I play a racquetball in my bare feet, and I jog in my bare feet out there in the blacktop at night, and I play field hockey in my bare feet. I do not play ice hockey in my bare feet, <laughs> but the other. And I was out in my bare feet, you know, wrecking that yard, maybe had a slip in my pants or something, you know. And about that time, I heard some tires go, <clears throat> screech, and I turned around and looked up, and this guy had driven into the parking lot with his family all the way from Alabama with a load of stuff on top of the car, and he'd come in there and seen me and was trying to get out of there without letting me know he'd been there and dragged off. That fella came there and he took one look at that little old cheap trailer and that little old yard and them torn britches and he decided maybe that wasn't the right school to go to after all. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know what that is? Chicken, chicken little. I've seen them. I've seen them. You know, years ago, I'd get invited up here, uh, Beach and Vic every year, and Harold Henniger every year. They'd fly me up here to DC 10, you know, and I'd sit in the uh, first class and eat steaks all the way up, you know, and get out. They'd put me in Ramadi Inn, you know, or Holiday Inn, you know, or Griswold or someplace, you know, or the Hilton, you know, one of them places, or the Marriott, and say, discharge your meals, you know. I'd get up in front of the congregation there, four or five thousand people in a little monkey suit, you know, and preach. And you'd be surprised how many young fellows thought they were called to preach when they saw that. Yeah. Oh, I don't look too hard. I think I can do that. <laughs> and they'd come down to Pensacola with their wife and drive down to see my school, you know. I've seen them come down there. Before I had a nice home, I got a nice home now. I'm downright spoiled now. But not back in those days. In those days, I had a little cracker box of a house. It was about, I guess it was about uh, 20 feet by about 50 feet, something like that. And I've seen those cars come down there and pull up, you know, Cadillacs, big old mobiles, with a couple in the front and a couple in the back, you know, all dressed up, and pull up in front of my house. I'd be in the backyard with my bare feet. 
I never wear shoes unless I have to. I think they're the devil. <laughs> I'll be out there my bare feet cleaning fish, you know, <laughs> throwing fish heads around, fish guts, you know, and get her doing a little frying. And I've seen those cars pull up and those women, the women, you know, the guy's wife, <laughs> look out the window. And suddenly, he'd lose the call to preach. <laughs> You'd be amazed how many young men thought they were called to preach. They saw that house, and they decided they hadn't been called after all. The Yankee women must be something. I remember one time we went to Baptist Fundamentalism up in, uh, in Washington, D.C. with Fowler. I went to that thing, you know. I mean, I, I don't care who I keep coming with. <laughs> and, I, and I took some of my mafia with me. I had Nidering with me. He's a German. Got wrist bone, the biggest year thigh bone, man. He's a fellow built his own house, does his own plumbing, carpentry, electronic work, welding, the whole built his own house. He's sitting there. He's about 35, and I have Reed sitting over here. He's a racquetball player and a handball player, and over here got McGahee. He's an old Irishman. I, I took a, I was with bad company to start with, and a couple other fellows in my church, you know. All my fellows are between about 20 and 35, and they're all black belts or weightlifters or been in the slammer or something. <laughs> kind of a mafia, <laughs> and we're sitting up there watching that thing, and that Baptist fundamentalist, that's the most ungodly mess I've ever seen in all my life, man. I mean, I felt defiled after being there two or three nights. There's big old screens up here, 20 feet square, you know, with all this uh, contemporary Christian music on it, you know, all the little girls, you know, and the boys, the powdered wigs and the little lace shirts, you know, and the girls would sing and the boys would look at them and the boys sing and the girls look at them. You know all that junk you watch on television. And stand up there, you know, you know, and some girl singing, Jesus, keep me near the cross. Painted up like a possum hunter in Pokeberry time. She looked like a Hollywood slut, man. She didn't look like a Christian. And then some guy got up there, you know, on the microphone, got his mouth right up there because he didn't have a voice carry 30 feet. And he got singing, uh, then came the morning, then came the morning, you know. I got up the next morning, six o'clock in the motel, opened the door, those guys were still asleep, and said, Then came the morning. <laughs> Get them out of bed. <laughs> and you know, the longer we stayed at that thing, the rougher it got. I mean, we got, you know, making bad remarks, bad spirit, man. I'd come out of there, I'd just feel unclean, man. And uh, somebody start to start to sing and finish, everybody would clap, and McGee would turn to me and say, Ah, oh, puke. <laughs> you know what I got <laughs> And pretty soon the Christians around us began getting kind of nervous, you know, and turn around, you know. And I forget about the third night, if it had gone on anymore, tell me that that would have been, it got bad, man. And about the third night, the lady sitting down in front of us turned around to me and said, what kind of Christians are you anyway? And I said, the kind of enjoy herself. <laughs> and her husband turned around and glared at me, and I was expecting trouble, you know, so I crossed my hand, you know. And you come up like this, see, you can deflect anything coming at you, left or right. <laughs> and I figure when he comes up, I'll just, you know, just spread him and then put him over about three seats ahead, down with the slope. I get him three rows easy, you know. Well, like this. At about that time, Cargo, he's an iron worker, six feet one, 350 pounds, punches me, oh, don't worry about it, he'd have to ask her permission before he could hit you. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you know what I think it is? I think maybe some of you Yankee men, I think maybe you step out in your eyes, maybe they catch you at it. And they kind of use that as kind of a bar, a hammer to hold over your head for the next 10 to 50 years, so you've got to be a good little boy. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> is anybody home? <laughs> Oh, yes, let me tell you, there's more than meets the eye. Well, anyway, he got up there, and his wife comes out there and says, Don't touch this man, have nothing to do with him. I've suffered many things this day, a dream because of him. And the old boy's got him in his hands again, he can't get rid of him. Do you know Jesus Christ, the hardest person you ever try to shuffle off in all your life? I mean, you can get rid of me, but you talk about a bad penny coming back. You try to get rid of Jesus Christ. You walk out of this door this morning, thus and guess I am without one plea, but that thy blood be shed for me, that thy bid me come to thee, and you get to another invitation, you won't, you won't make a step forward. I've seen them down south. Down south, we got guys in their 50s and 60s and 70s. They go to three revival meetings every year and been three revival meetings every year for 50 years, and they're still not saved. 
And they go out the door thinking they beat it. I made it again. I got to another meeting without getting saved. Uh huh. And one of these days, you'd be out there pinning under a car, boy, about three o'clock in the morning, them wheels spinning the air, and that thing coming down there, whoop, 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 coming down there, and you'll have to deal with him then. When you get there on that emergency table down there, and they'll start shooting you full of stuff so you don't feel the stitches and stuff, you, you won't beat Jesus Christ. Now, I'm from a color folk saying, so high you can't get over it, so low you can't get under it, so wide you can't get around it, you must come in at the door. And that's the truth. Playing the coward. That didn't work. And I'd cry out there yelling, kill him, kill him, kill him, kill him, kill him. Why would evil hath he done? Kill him, kill him, crucify him, crucify him. Why, my Bible says Pilate knew that for envy the chief priest had delivered him. Pilate knew from the very start why he was delivered, and Pilate knew from the very start that Jesus Christ was perfectly innocent. And he was determined to let him go. But he didn't have any courage. He couldn't make it. The terrible thing like that when a man... Lose his soul just because he's a coward. Terrible thing. He tried something else. And I've seen men try this. I've seen this many a time. He tried cleverness. I'll figure my way out. I'll figure my way out. The way to beat this thing. Use your head, boy. Keep cool. Keep cool. And he got thinking to himself, now let's see. They want a prisoner at least every year at this time. And we got Barabbas here. He's a notable prisoner. Bible said he has wanted an in, in insurrection for murder. And he was already a robber. Now, Barabbas was a robber. So you know what kind of fellow he was? A seditionist, a robber, and a murderer. And he said, I'll put Barabbas up there and I'll say, which one do you want to hand to let go, Jesus or Barabbas? And when they see that Barabbas, they'll surely want him killed and they'll let Jesus go. Surely. Got it figured out? Got it figured out? I mean, they just, they're just a little bit upset, a little bit nervous, and the police got them kind of upset. I'll put him up there, and they'll get Barabbas and let this Jesus go and have him off my hands. Got it made in the shade. I'd use your head, old boy. That's the way they got to punch his part. Got it made. <laughs> put him out there, put Barabbas up over here, put Jesus up over there, and said, Which will you that I release unto you? And they said, Barabbas. And he said, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called the King of the Jews? And they said, Kill him! And he had him on his hand again. You don't, you don't slough off Christ like that. You know what Pontius Pilate's problem was? His problem was he didn't understand human nature. He was what you call a positive thinker. You know what his trouble was? He didn't want to be judgmental. He wanted to share, you know. He wanted to be judgmental. And he got that thing all figured out, but he didn't know human nature. You see, when he put Barabbas up there and Christ over there, he figured this way. He figured, well, when they see that Barabbas, they'll know he's a dirty rascal, and they'll want his hide. When they see Jesus Christ, they're kind of upset right now, but they'll let him off the hook. They're not really mad at him. They're just a little bit kind of stirred up. But listen, when he got them up there and put those two up there, they looked at old Barabbas, and they said, now, there's that Barabbas. He's a rascal. Yeah, he's a cutter. He's a pistol ball, all right. I saw him out there with some of his wife the other night. Yeah, he's, he's, but, but, you know, he's handicapped, you know, and... I mean, being raised in the ghetto, what could you expect, you know? I mean, if you had disadvantage like that, why, well, maybe you'd turn out that way too, and, and he's not such a bad fellow. I mean, sure, he's a killer and a thief, but you know, perhaps it's just a, a little case of discrimination, and after all, he's so much like me. <laughs> Saw Christ stand over there, so is that Christ? I never did like that fellow. Makes me nervous. Well, what is about that? He's weird. He's odd. He's peculiar. I just don't understand him. Never caught him doing anything wrong, but he just, he, he talks too loud. He makes me nervous. I, I can't do other one who is around. He's, he's, he's always uh, he's yelling at you and he, he's, he's just not, he's just not like one of us. He's a kill him! Had him on his hands again. Didn't know much about human nature. I've seen men do that. I've seen, that's the thing that men do. What the Bible says in the book of 1 Corinthians, it says, when it pleased God, he said, when the world, listen, when the world, by wisdom, knew not God. That's how they get out of it, with a head. They think the way out. The world's greatest religious systems are religious systems that are designed to get a man out of making the decision that Pilate had to make. You know what Buddhism is? Buddhism is a system where you get rid of your karma, and you follow prajna, you follow the noble eightfold path, path to attain prajna, or enlightenment, or samadhi, or nirvana. That way you don't have to receive Jesus Christ. You know what Mohammedanism is? I mean, abstain from liquor, you know, 
Baal returned today to Mecca. Wash, Elada, Shale, Mohammed, El Mektum, Mektum, Bismala. And that way you don't have to receive Jesus Christ. You know what Protestantism is? Keep the golden rule. Keep the Ten Commandments. Pray the Lord's Prayer. That way you don't have to receive Jesus Christ. You know what the Catholic way is? Find the church that Christ founded. Take the sacraments. Go down there and put that wafer in your mouth. Pretend that's Jesus Christ. That way you don't have to receive him. You get rid of him and go back next Sunday and get him again. Fifteen cents a dozen, ten for a dollar. You know what those things are? That's man trying to figure that thing out. Cleverness. The world's greatest systems that man ever thought of were systems devised to get around receiving Jesus Christ as Savior. They come to nothing. My father had a master's degree from MIT in Boston. Back in the days when uh, if you went to MIT, you had to have something on the ball to get through there. IQ about 150, I guess. He spent his life studying geology as a civilian civil engineer in the Army as a colonel. World War II, a captain of World War I. My dad went to college for 10 years to study geology so he could disprove Genesis. You know why I want to disprove Genesis? So he could get out of receiving Jesus Christ. The bigger the belfry, the more room for the bats. <laughs> that stuff, that stuff is man trying to think his way through. Uh, you, you know what a college education is generally? It, it's just a, it's just a process of ramming a set of prejudices down your head. Yeah. You go to college, they say, keep an open mind. You keep an open mind, they'll fill it full of garbage. Yep. Right. Some of you folks ought to close your mind for repairs. Amen. All, this, all this stuff. You know what that is, man? That's man trying to get around God, trying to think his way through. I remember I dealt with my mother and daddy right after I was saved, and I didn't get anywhere with them because I was a new Christian. I didn't know how to witness. I made the biggest mess you ever saw. But after I'd been saved about, oh, about... Uh, Eight years, I went back up north and dealt with my mother and daddy up in Delaware when my father was retired. When I got up there that time, I knew how to handle him. And I caught, caught him off and got him back in the back room, and I said after a while, we'd argued and talked about a number of things. I said, the de I said, I said, Dad, I said, the devil's going to get you. He said, I don't believe in a devil. He said, I believe if there was an, a force opposing God in the universe, you couldn't count on the law of the universe to hold up. For example, he says, if you couldn't count the laws of the universe to hold up, in building a bridge, you couldn't count on the tensile strength of steel. Give me the engineer stuff. And, you know, back in the old days, I'd have tried to read a back textbook and engineer and argue with him, but I had better sense after I'd been saved a while. I put my finger on him, and I said, Dad, I said, the devil is not interested in the tensile strength of steel. He's interested in damning your soul. My dad backed off and got that thing, ran out of the room, ran out of the room. Far as I know, he never got saved. I've been to his grave up there, a little old grave with a little marker up there in Fiber Hobbit Beach, Delaware. And see another little marker there. As far as I know, he lived without Christ and died without Christ, went out unprepared to meet God alone in the world without hope and without God. Brilliant fella! Just didn't have any sense, like some of you. Going to use his brain to figure, what about the heathen? What about the folks that never heard? What about all those folks that don't have a Bible? And do you mean to tell me that God would damn anybody? And if God is love, uh -huh, uh -huh, ain't you the bright one? You know what that is? That's man exercising that noodle. I'll think my way out. I'll work. You'll go to hell. You'll go to hell. You'll burn like a bullet. You'll burn like a torch. You'll burn like a greaseball, boy. Your brain going to get you out. He got that whole thing figured out and had Christ on his hand again. The crowd's outside. Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Why? What evil hath he done? He made himself the Son of God. What? He made himself the Son of God. Uh-oh. <laughs> and then he calls Jesus in and calls him in there and says, Where are you from? Do you ever realize what a question that is? That's an outer space question. That's a Star Wars question. <laughs> That's a Star Trek question. That's a 20th century question. Why, listen, where are you from? He knew where he was from. He was from Galilee. Why, he knew he was from Galilee, or he wouldn't have set him up to Herod. When he calls him and says, where are you from? He's not talking about down here. Humanoid boy, Darth Vader man. That Bible's so far ahead of Space Center, they don't know what they're doing. And Pilate says, where are you from? 
No answer. Don't you know I got power over you, crucify you, and let you go? You could have no power over me at all except the were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered you into my hand and me into your hand hath the greater sin. And that's the last word Pontius Pilate ever heard him say. The last word he ever heard Jesus Christ, the Son of God, say was a three letter word. Sin. Sin. This is the condemnation that light is coming to the world. And men love darkness rather than light, because the deeds were evil. And everyone that does evil hates the light, neither cometh to it, lest his deeds should be reproved. The problem of men is sin. They pretend it's other things. Lack of understanding, lack of education, lack of research. Sin. And Pilate had him on his hands again. And the crowd's out there roaring, let him go, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate saying, shall I crucify your king? And that bunch is hollering, we have no king but Caesar. We want the Pope. We want the Roman ruler. And the Lord says, you want the Roman ruler? Those Jews said, yes, sir, Caesar. The Lord said, okay, I'll give you Caesar. So Adolf Hitler is a Roman. And Heinrich Himmler is a Roman. And Gehring is a Roman. And the commandant of Auschwitz concentration camp is a Roman, Rudolf Hess. And the commandant of Tremica is Kurt von Stango, a Roman. And the head of Gestapo Himmler is a Roman. And the head of the secret police, Gehring, is a Roman. You Jews want Caesar? You got it. That crowd out there says, His blood be upon us and our children. You want Caesar? You get him. You'll send an ambassador over there and he'll send you a nuncio back. Amen, amen, amen. I know it's kind of over your head up here, but just pray about it. You'll get it after a while. It'll come through you after a while. All right, so out there in that crowd are saying, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar. Pilate's in a mess. Boy, you ever met a man that had need of... Uh, Mental therapy. <laughs> he should have bought a book on how to cope with Christ. <laughs> One of these modern fellows. And he's walking up down there and he says, I know what it is. I got, I got it made. I got it made. I got, I know what to do and how to fix this thing. Got to figure it figured out. And this is the last thing a man does. The last thing a man does before he goes to hell is compromise. He'll come halfway. Last thing a man does before he finishes it off is come halfway and try to buy God off. Well, I won't get saved. I won't receive Christ, but I will join the church and get baptized. I will buy a Bible, let my wife read it. I will start giving money to the cerebral Paul, the United Dry and the United Fund, and I'll not speak against anybody's faith, <laughs> but it fix things up. Cut the corner. You know half the distance to the, to the goal line is? It's not a goal. You know half the distance of the goal line is after you take half the distance and half the distance and half of half of half the distance, you're not there yet. You can cut it in half until infinity and you'll never get there. The last thing that men try is compromise. So you know what Pilate did? You know what he did? He took Jesus Christ down there in the Praetorian Guardsman Hall and they put a crown of thorns around his head. And they whipped him with an inch of his life. By his stripes you're healed. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, honor your father and your mother. Slapped his face to pieces, came out there soaking in blood, dripping from blood, head to foot, and brought him out there and said, Behold the man. And they said, Kill him! And he had him on his hands again. He figured the people just a little blood lost. They just want to see a little blood on the left glove, you know. They're out there on the highway with a broken glass, and they see the blood, they'll lay off. They saw the blood and they said, kill him, and he had him on his hands again. You know, I, I really, honestly, I, uh, without any sarcasm intended, I feel sorry for people like Pontius Pilate. I feel sorry for people who can't face a thing and then decide one way or another. Uh, it, I've never had the trouble some people have. Of course, I got my own troubles, you got your troubles, and everybody got some kind of trouble. But I never had a trouble, I'll tell you one problem I never had in life. I'll be 64 here in about a month, and the one problem I never had in 64 years, getting along with people. 
I never cared whether I did or didn't. <laughs> I never hampered wanting to make friends. I never cared anything about making friends. I choose my friends. I got a few friends. People don't think I do. I've got a few friends. They're good friends, too. I got just enough friends to keep me happy and just enough enemies to keep me awake. <laughs> but I never worried about it. I think the most terrible job in the world would be that battle of a fellow trying to get votes. I could never do it. I can't talk five minutes without making an enemy. If I talk five minutes, I, I bet I've made some good lifelong enemies right here this week. It wouldn't surprise me a bit. Murphy's Law, you know. You know, friends come and go, but one good enemy will last you for a lifetime. <laughs> I can't imagine anything worse than going to the farmers and say, I'm for you, you're not getting the right kind of prices, and going to the retailers and say, these farmers are giving you the shaft, I'll take care of you, and then go to the buyer and say, and they're giving you the shaft down the grocery store, you ought to have lower prices. Yes. I can't imagine what it would be like to talk that way. I think it's just foreign to me, I can't even get a hold of it. I never could figure how a fellow could talk more than ten minutes without making enemies. You take a, there's some men that can talk and talk and talk and never offend anybody. I don't understand. I think you have to have a talent. You have to be a genius or something to do stuff like that. You take, uh, you take Jimmy Carter and Lyndon Johnson and Captain Kangaroo. Those three people have talked and talked and talked. Why, Captain Kangaroo's been on television 20 years, hasn't he? And no enemies. That's amazing. <laughs> I don't understand that. <laughs> I understand a guy can talk for 20 minutes without making an enemy. Or some folks, they just... You know, some folks want to be friends with everybody. They want to get along with everybody. They're friendly, they're sweet, they're kind, they're sociable. And th th maybe that's fine, maybe that's what it'll be, but I feel sorry for you if you like that. You know why I feel sorry for you? Because you can't get along with everybody. There's no way on God's earth to please God and men. It cannot be done. <laughs> and some of you Christians keep thinking you can do it. You can do it. You're going to rough somebody, you're going to mess somebody up, you're going to get somebody mad at you if you try to do right. And if you're going to make up your mind to get along, folks, you just make up your mind to do wrong and get to it. Because you ain't going to be able to please them. It's never been hard for me to say no to people. And I know some folks that have a terrible time doing that. Pontius Pilate had a time. You know what his real problem was? He just couldn't say no. He couldn't turn them down. If that fellow had taken off his law wreath and put it on Christ's head and taken off his toga and put it over Christ's shoulders and said, There's your king, crucify me. <laughs> He'd have gone down to the greatest man that ever lived in history. If he could have just risen to the occasion, if he just had the guts, there have been more books written about him than written about Napoleon and Abraham Lincoln. But he couldn't make it. You get standing and singing, just I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thy bids me come to the old Amazon, I come. And somewhere in this congregation here this morning will be a man. And it'll be fairly moral. And a pretty good man. Not any real hell raiser or whoremonger. Maybe a man of uprightness and integrity. But he just won't have the guts to get out of that aisle. And he'll just lose this year and next year and the next year and the next year. Maybe he'll go off and join a big liberal church someplace and hide in the congregation and then go to hell when he dies. Now the trouble is, no courage, boy, no courage. I used to have a fellow leading singing for me. His name was Bob Persons. And Bob Persons, an all-American tackle from Wisconsin. He liked these big hunkies you see in the pro line. I mean, six feet three, 320 pounds. Like the refrigerator, you know. Six feet three, 320. That old boy, if he came to that door, his shoulders would rub in that door with a suit on coming through. He used to be my song leader. You think we didn't make a pair? I've had to sleep with that guy at night, and I'd be sleeping on a tilt all night long in that bed. He got saved, drunk aboard ship at Pearl Harbor, a USS Bushnell. And I knew he'd been in the Navy, so when I want to get out in the morning, about seven in the morning, I'd go, <whistles> Now, hear this. <laughs> old Bob hit the ground. <laughs> he hit the ground with his bare feet. Boy, I'd catch him on that time and time again, you know. <whistles> hear this. Number two, brothers, a gunner, report the bows, mate. He come out of bed and all rough man, you're trying to go. <laughs> and he was a he wasn't intellectual, very, very dumb fellow. He wasn't as stupid as an ox, but he wasn't any smarter either. 
And that old boy, you take old Bob Person, he, he loved the Lord, but he never read the Bible much. He'd pray a lot. He loved the Lord, but he just, you know, just thick-headed. He's a Swede. I used to kid him about it. About once or twice a year, I'd say, Bob, what's dumber than a dumb Irishman? At least I don't know. <laughs> I'd say a smart Swede. <laughs> and he'd say, oh, it ain't funny, Ruckman. He's funny, Ruckman. <laughs> I'd get him on every every year, six every six months. He'd forget the joke. <laughs> and I've seen old Bob sit down at a, at a meal and eat a whole loaf of bread with a meal. I mean, a loaf of bread with a meal. He'd eat the meal, a whole loaf of bread right down with a meal. And I said, Bob, you're going to kill yourself, man. What do you weigh? Oh, 350, 360, getting up in there. I said, man, you got to quit eating, man. You get diabetes or something. I said, you kill yourself for your time, man. I said, Quit eating. He said, well, they keep passing it to me. <laughs> and I said, well, turn them down. Tell them no thank you. He said, I do tell them no thank you, but they keep on passing it. I said, look, I said, tell them no like you mean it. He said, well, you don't understand. He said, you're so mean when you say yes. It sounds like no. <laughs> and, and I said, I'm so sweet when I say no, it sounds like yes. <laughs> and they keep on passing it to me. And they did. He got up to around 400, and then he, one morning he woke up, and the leg was black, you know, and they cut off the leg up the knee, and then he had a heart attack driving the car a couple of years later and died. I had the heart attack, got him before the car wreck uh, got him, and the car came to pieces, and he wasn't, he wasn't 55 yet. You know what Bob's trouble was? He couldn't say no. He couldn't turn him down. That's what, you know, we need out there in the public schools about 10,000 young people looking right in the face and say, no as an N-O, meaning no. Don't you want to be popular? No. Don't you get in the crowd? No thank you. Have one of these? No thanks. Try one of these? No thanks. Well, you're not a man to you try no as an N-O, no. That's what we need. We don't need any more positive, sweet-thinking yes talkers. We don't need you. Go drown yourself. <laughs> The thing that's killing this country is you don't have the power of negative thinking. <laughs> the thing that's killing this country, that's right, brother. You just people stand up there and say, no, N-O, and that's final. That's what you need. Oh, Pontius couldn't do it. Didn't want to hurt the feelings. Didn't want to lose his position. Got out there, went to peace on him again. Compromise. I've seen men compromise. You say, Rucky, you've been tempted to compromise? Well, I guess so, but... With me, it's not much of a temptation, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm not never, you could put up pretty hard to get ten me to compromise, because I don't, I don't think anything about it, you know. I don't, some of you probably wonder why when I get up here and talk, they boo me when I come up here. That's a whole of from the Chautauqua youth camps. And the Chautauqua youth camps, I used to get up there and they'd applaud when I got up there. And I told the director, I don't want those kids applauding when I get up there. I'm up there for an entertainment, a put on performance, I'm there to preach. I said, I'd feel more at home if they booed. So next year when I came in, there were about 1,200 of them there. Here's Brother Ruckman, woo, walked through there. I said, thank you, appreciate that. <laughs> and I do, you say, why is that? Because when people treat me like that, I can get along with them. But I understand being kicked around. All folks nasty and mean to me, I understand them. I feel at home, I feel comfortable. <laughs> people be nice to me, it's embarrassing. Some of you don't understand that, do you? <laughs> Well, I put up with you, you can put up with me. It takes all kinds of odd ducks, you know. But he folks give me a good offering, you know, and a good place to stay and brag about me, you know. I just, uh, oh, man. I don't, you know, I don't know how to respond. I don't know how to act, you know. The guy cussed me out and says a heretic called us and a blankety blank should be in the ministry. Appreciate it. Thank you, brother. I know where I am now. I mean, I, you know what I like? I like the side drawn even, man, where you can tell where you're at. We got playing hockey the other day, and a new guy came on the field and said, well, who's on whose side? I said, stick around, you'll find out real quick. <laughs> you don't have to even be told, man, that hockey game won't go five minutes. You know who your buddies are and who the ones aren't. You'll find out real quick. I like that. I like it going right down the middle. You take old Pontius Pilate, he went around the middle and one foot over here and one foot over here. Gathered together against him, determined to let him go. You know what happened then, don't you? He lost his soul. He lost his soul. Years ago, I had a good friend. He's up in, way up uh, north of here, in north of uh, Canada, up near Dryden. And he's up there. His name is Garland Cofield. 
And Garland Coalfield is a missionary of the Canadian Indians, has a good work up there. And Garland Coalfield is from Tennessee. And how a Tennessee boy got up in Canada, I don't know. But every winter, Garland will phone me up somewhere in the middle of winter and say, Well, how you doing there, Mother Pete? I said, Okay. So I just had a little time on my hand before I phone you up to ask you some Bible questions. I said, go ahead, is it cold up there? No, not very cold. We haven't been able to get out for about two weeks now, but it isn't too bad. It's only about 30 below zero. <laughs> I start shaking hold on the phone, man. I mean, 30 below zero. Whew, whew, boy, I like it right between 85 and 90, see, where you're just kind of a steam bath all the time. I used to take old Garvin Coalfield years ago. He used to lead singing for Hyman Appleman and Bar Rolf Barnard and Dolphus Price. And then he left and became the assistant uh, pastor for Logson at the, at the Emanuel Baptist Church in Holland, Michigan. And then after that, he left went to Rose Park. And when I knew Garland years ago, when he was leading singing for Eddie Martin, a fair-haired Southern Baptist evangelist, I went through uh, Tuscaloosa, Alabama to see him. But they had a meeting there in Denny Stadium. And I came uh, walked on the stadium there and came in there and I saw a uh, stadium where they'd been the night before and tracks and things lying around. And I stopped the fellow out there by the stadium and I said, can you tell me where Garland Cofield is? And he said, uh, yeah, he's in such and such a trailer court by such and such a number trailer. I said, good, thank you, and started to walk off. And the fellow said, uh, you're Pete Ruckman, aren't you? I said, yes. He said, I'm Eddie Martin, the evangelist. I said, glad to meet you. See you around. And I started off, and he said, wait a minute, I want to show you something. Took me over his car, had leopard skin seats in it, you know, back in 1960 uh, or 51. And uh, he took out a photograph of Denny Stadium, and he said, you see there? I preached all those folks in Denny Stadium last night, 14,000 people. I said, great, man, wonderful, wonderful. Anybody get saved? He said, yeah, we had about 40 conversions. I said, great, that's fine, see you around. Wait a minute, Peter, I want to talk to you a minute. He said, you know, Pete, he said, you never get anywhere as long as you're car carrying the torch for Bob Jones, Sr. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, well, as long as you're carrying the torch for Bob Jones, Sr., you'll never get anywhere in the ministry. I said, I'm not carrying the torch for anybody. I'm just trying to preach what God tells me to preach. And he said, but, Ruck, when you never reach the masses as long as you're connected with Bob Jones, Sr. I said, I'm not trying to reach the masses. I'm trying to do what God tells me to do. Good day, and left him. I went over to Garland Cofields when I got in the trailer court and walked up to Garland. He was sitting there barbecuing some steaks, he and his wife, and I came up and said, How you doing, man? He said, Good to see you. Need a song leader? I said, No. He said, Any time you want me to go with you, let me know and I'll go. I said, You crazy, man. I said, Didn't you lead about uh, 14,000 people singing in Danny Stadium last night? He said, Yeah. I said, You. You come along with me, you won't be fair like that. You'll be sleeping in the back seat of a car, man, eating black eyed peas. You don't want to come with me. He said, any time you're ready, let me know. We sat down there and got eating the steaks, and about that time I saw Eddie Martin come into the trailer court, had a couple of young men with him. I said, who are those? He said, those are some converts that got saved in the meeting last night. I said, what's he doing with them? He said, oh, they, they, they're called to preach, and you're going to tell them what school to go to. I said, where were you going to tell them to go to school? He said, oh, Mercer, you know, or Judson, or Howard, or Stetson. And as they walked in those trailers over there, I said, tell them to go to Tennessee Temple of Bob Jones. <laughs> Went on, slammed the door. We went on eating. I forgot to eat, and Eddie Martin came out, came over to me, was, took my hand, kind of a pain look. You know, some of these pious fellows have a peculiar look of kind of a, look like they're constipated or something, you know what I mean? I mean, <laughs> did you ever see that? Did you ever see something? Well, well, my brother Ruckman, it's, it's, I just, we're just praying for you, brother. Like, like, settle down, kid, settle down. Do thyself no harm, we're all here. And he came and shook my hand and said, now, now, brother Ruckman, I'm trying to help you. I said, fine. He said, now, we, we'd like to set you up. I've got some simultaneous campaigns I can't take, and the association missionary will set these big association meetings. I'm just looking for a man I can trust. I said, you can trust me. And he said, yeah, but we can't have Bob Jones Sr.'s name mentioned from the pulpit publicly. I said, why not? He said, well, he's not a, he's not a real Baptist. And I said, I'm a Baptist. He said, yeah, but you're not Baptistic enough. And that did it. I said, go on that trailer and get a Bible. I'll get my Bible. Let's see who's a Baptist and who ain't, okay? Then he backed off. I found out why he backed off. He wasn't in a Baptist church. He was a Plymouth Brethren. The Southern Baptists had him hooked up to the machine. 
Gee, ain't we a fine bunch of godly folks, huh? Brother Ruckman, I'm just trying. <laughs> I thought, see, when they start, when they start butting me up, brother, I begin to back off, boy. Had a fellow brother, you got a fellow right here in town trying to butter me up for the night. Tell me I was a strong Christian. Don't kid me, boy. They start that stuff with me, I start getting my God up and get ready to go. I ain't going to fool that mess. And he says, well, now, Brother Ruckman, he said, he said, what I mean is they don't support everything we support. And I said, no, thank you, Eddie. And he left. You know what that fellow offered me? He offered me the moon on a string. In Carolina, they say, if there's any string attached, there's probably a rope at the end of it. That fella, just one little compromise. Listen, I didn't have to quit preaching the King James Bible. I didn't have to deny the fundamentals. All I had to do was not, just not mention one man's name, and I was in. Wouldn't have some of you grab that thing like a piece of cake? Not me. You say, why? It's easier for me to say, nope, <coughs> no business today, store closed. When I come in here and get to this platform, Brother Noe doesn't put one string in me before I get in here. He doesn't make any requirement of me. Turn me loose, and then he pays the price. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you something else. When he gets in my pulpit, it'll be the same way there. When he gets in my pulpit, help yourself, go. Don't you ever preach in any place where there's a string attached. I'll tell you, if a Roman Catholic priest asks me to preach down to St. Michael or St. Stephen's brother, as long as he don't lay any condition, I'll go. Of course, it'll be a one-time visit, brother. <laughs> <laughs> they won't invite me back. No strings, compromise. Well, let's wind it up. You know what happened to Pilate? He had him crucified. Finally washed his hand and said, I'm innocent in the blood of this just person. See ye to it. And they said, His blood be upon us and upon our children. And Pilate lived on for a few years after that, and I suppose after a while he died and went to hell. You know what his problem was? He couldn't do what he knew was right to do because he didn't have the courage of his convictions to do it. In the midnight watches, hark thy bosom door. Someone knocking. Knocking. Knocking evermore. Say not, tis my pulse beating, for it is thy heart of sin. And thy Savior knocking, crying, soul arise and let me in. Death comes on with reckless footsteps to palace, home, and hut. Think you death will tarry knocking where the door is shut? Jesus standing, knocking, waiting. But your sinful heart stands fast. Grieved away, your Savior leaveth. Death comes in at last. Then you will be standing, begging Christ to let thee in, beating at the gate of heaven, covered with your sin. God forbid, you guilty sinner, heaven's not your lot. Jesus waited long to know thee, but now he knows thee not. It's like that. Just like that. Jesus is standing in Pilate's hall, friendless, forsaken, betrayed by all. Hearken but me at the sudden call, what will you do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus? Neutral you cannot be, someday your heart will be asking, what will he do with me? Will you evade him as Pilate tried? Or will you take him whatever betide? Vainly you struggle from him to hide. What will you do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus? Neutral you cannot be. Someday your heart will be asking, what will he do with me? Now, probably in this building somewhere right now, there's a man who's a good man as far as men go, and the only thing in the world he can get to say is just courage 
to get out of your seat and confess Christ your Savior. We ought to stand and sing an invitation hymn here. I'd like every Christian in this building to say, I want you to pray. While we stand, I want you to pray and ask God to give anybody in this building here this morning the courage they need to do what they know is right. Just pray that prayer while we sing. Pray that prayer. Say, God, that person that needs to receive Christ and wants to receive Christ, give them courage. Some of you don't understand that, see? It'd be easy for you. It was easy for me. First time I heard the gospel, I got saved. I was down the aisle before they sang two standards. Nothing to me. But it's a terrible price for some men to pay, and they're timid. And they're, they tend to be cowardly when faced with a moral issue. You pray for me and ask God to help me. Let's sing just as I am without one plea. You don't need your books for that. Let's sing just as I am without one plea. But that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bids me come to the old land of God I come. You pray for the timid here and the retiring and those that want to get along with everybody. You ask God to give them the courage this morning to do right and come out for Christ. All right, Brother Lewis. I want to do something a little different.